Hello and welcome back to the Reapers. Today we're doing a video as requested to compare the Warbirds, the World War II fighter aircraft that are in DCS at the moment. At the moment there are just four planes so this is how we're going to do it for these four planes. Uh, in the future more are going to come and we'll probably just update this video uh, when it comes. So first of all we're going to just run through the statistics and I'll just reel them off. Then we're going to have a talk about what they're actually like uh, to fly in DCS and just a general bit of history we've got Star with us today because he knows a shed load more about Warbirds than me so first of all for the Spitfire we have the Mark 9 Spitfire we don't know what actual Mark 9 derivative we have someone obviously knows but I, I don't know um, it was well you know it's an LF at least it's a what sorry? it's an LF at least a oh. low altitude Spitfire oh I never knew that see I'm learning already well done What's LF actually mean then? L low. I think it's literally low flying, if I recall correctly. So, are we saying in that case it's optimized for low altitude? Yeah, the engine's just more efficient down there. How interesting! And that's one thing we're going to uh, see a lot of today, especially with piston engines, is that they have. Uh, how am I going to explain this, Dal? Uh, they are very different in their optimization, their optimal working, depending on the altitude. So, a plane is probably optimized for. I mean, it's the same with jets, really. Uh, optimized for high altitude or optimized for low or optimized kind of as an average uh, you'll you'll very find you, you won't find an aircraft that is optimized for all altitudes especially not in this era had a quick look by the way uh, Google says low altitude fighter is what it stands for low altitude fighter right cool uh, right the next thing to say all of our information here is comes from the DCS world encyclopedia we found that the most it's obviously going to be the most relevant if you look up to check some of this on um, Wikipedia or something, you'll probably find the figures differ a lot, and that's because it's not as clear cut as we've got here. They're, they're all they're, within each version of these aeroplanes. There are more subversions. Uh, as an example, the Mark Nine Spitfire. There are several different versions of the Mark Nine Spitfire. Uh, so that's just something to be careful of. Right. So uh, the date uh, that the planes we've got here, this June 1992 for the Spitfire, uh, because 42. Yeah, sorry. Uh, 19, yeah, 1942 for the Spitfire. Uh, it would be nice if they were all of the same year because then there would be direct historical uh, comparisons, but they're not, and that's fine. That's just how the, the builders wanted to make it. So we have to just bear that in mind that this aircraft here is a couple of years or more younger than the other three here. So, yeah. Uh, 19, June 1994 for the P-51D, September 1994 for the Dora, and October 1994, sorry, I keep saying that, you know what I mean, 1944 for the Kerrburst. Uh, next, if we look at armament, all of these planes, as far as I'm aware, I know the Spitfire at least, had a, several different armaments uh, throughout the versions, and this one had four times cold burning 7.6... 7.7 mil machine guns. What's that? 0 0.33 inches? Roughly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, plus two Hispano Mark II 20 mil cannons. Uh, I find that the 7.7 .7 machine guns don't really do much. And I know the earlier versions of the Spitz had just, I think they had eight 7.7 .7 mil machine guns. And they were just pe pepper the bombers and the 109s in kind of Battle of Britain time we're talking. But I think there was even a hurricane with more like twelve or so. Were, yeah, I remember. I remember reading it in one of my one of my books. Uh, they would pepper this these meshes bits, and the meshes bits would have you know like metal flying off them and smoke bellowing out. But they never really had. They it rarely did fatal hits. Um, they weren't enough. More importantly, try taking down a bomber like a Hankler One Eleven or something like that. Good luck. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's yeah. For for whatever the reason is, the things that really did the damage were the cannon, high explosive cannon shells. When you read in in in, in the book uh, in in the history, pilots would often get hit by small arms fire and go and land. But if they got hit by a twenty mil shell that exploded, um, it did massive damage, didn't it? Um, and it can carry bombs as well. Uh, three times two hundred and fifty pounds bombs, which is cool. What's WIP? Do you think? Work in progress. Oh, well, yeah, that was before I had the bombs. We do have the bombs now. And I think it could have a fuel tank as well, or at least one fuel tank. Um, so that needs... But I can't remember the range. We should have looked at the range here, but we can talk about it tongue-in-cheek anyway. Right, so that's that. Mm, I'm going to do the uh, P-51. The armament is... I don't know how you feel about this. I've always been a bit spurious of the armament of the P-51. It's got six times half-inch Mark II uh, M2 Browning machine guns. Um, it's, so it's a halfway house really isn't it between small caliper and cannon and 
I don't know. I don't know what you think about it. I've not. I've never been too impressed by it, basically. But I don't know. I mean, the Americans always have lost the fifty cals. Um, they have tried putting twenty millimeter cannons on. I think the C version of the Corsair because uh, they designed those to intercept suicide uh, yeah. bombers that the Japanese used. Yeah. But they never liked them much, and I think their their twenty mil cannons had a lot of issues, like jamming a lot and what. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the thing is, you also can't forget these cannons are bloody heavy. So if you have yeah. a twenty millimeter cannon or a thirty millimeter cannon, that's a lot heavier than a twelve point seven. And to add on top of that, ammo. Uh, the muscle velocity of a twelve point seven millimeter round is going to be a lot higher, which makes it easier to hit a maneuvering target. Roger. Oh, and also the other thing about the cannons I don't like is you just don't get any ammo. Uh, so for dogfights, fighting other fighters, uh, they're pretty naff. You get a few bursts and that's it. And then you're down to your 7.7s and the Spitfire. It's probably the same with the Dora and the Curvus, But I guess they're more they anti-bomber a, for a, the cannons. Yeah, they have a bit more ammo, I think, comparatively. I mean, the 13mm cannon, it'll be a front line of 65 rounds, which is not that much. Yeah. But it's a massive projectile. And if you get really up close and personal and just slap it up their ass, they're going to hit the life. Yeah. Um, the door actually has a fair amount of 20mm ammo, I think it was like 200 rounds or so. Okay, um, it can also carry 8 times 127mm H5, god I completely forgot, oh, a high velocity aircraft rocket, that'll be it. Uh, rockets and 2 times, um, additionally I believe, 2, uh, two times 500 pound bombs, uh, which is pretty impressive really, it can carry a lot. Right, uh, let's go on to the Dora, uh, the armament. Is two times. Oh, I may need some help. Hein Metal Borsi MG131, 30 mil machine guns. So essentially half inch, you can say. Yeah. And Except I think the Germans also had actually high explosive ammunition for these, ah. which uh, wasn't really used in the uh, in the 50 cals that the Allied used. They had incendiary ammo in mm. the 51, but mm -hmm. not explosive as such. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and two times big bad boys, the Mauser MG151. Uh, now I notice, uh, where are they? Are they in the wings or the housing? I forget which is uh, which. Wing root. Uh, the, the 13, the half inch ones, are in the in the engine car. Roger. No. There's also different versions of the of the long nosed BF uh, Fakol 490. Um, some of them had, for example, two 20 mm the wing roots, and the third one uh, through the through the prop. Access ah, okay. and all kinds of stuff like that. Those, you know. I'm going to make a guess, and this is purely a guess, that they are lower velocity than the than the Hispanos on the Spitfire, purely because of the length of them. The Hispanos have always been really long. Yeah, you're guessing absolutely correctly. The MG 151s are uh, pretty low muscle velocity cannons, mm. but the big advantage they do have, um, you know, low muscle velocity means you're putting less stress on the projectile. Mm -hmm. And what the Germans did, they made really thin steel casings um, and filled a lot of explosive filler in there. So if you got hit by that, that just caused massive damage. Interesting, okay. That's, uh, you, you might have read that at some point. It's called Meningishos, what they did. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Right. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, 26 uh, can have... Was additionally, 26... Uh, anti-air, well they call them anti-air rockets I'm guessing because of the size of them we actually use them um, anti-ground and we've had, actually well, had we a lot use of them, success but, but they are supposed to be used against bombers, you know, something like a P-17 is a bitch to shoot down, so if you yeah. put a couple of uh, like explosive rockets into them, it goes a lot of Interesting, so they, they must have a quite a high velocity in that case, I'm guessing um, why? If you you know, if you come from behind and you have at least the same speed as the bomber does, you don't need the tire velocity. Okay, fine. Uh, right. Oh, anti-air rockets, anti-air rockets. Oh, t oh, I remember these now. Uh, you get the two Verfa Granata something grenade, um, twenty-one centimeter, so that's eight and a half inches, anti-air rockets, which are come in this big tube. And uh, what do you know about them, Shaw? They're massive, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they're kind of the idea, that's the same idea as high-caliber flak, I suppose. Uh, and by flak, I mean, like, the German anti-aircraft cannons. Um, so, they aren't necessarily designed to score a direct hit, um, but they are air-burst, so they'll just fly, ideally, somewhere close to the B-17 and blow up. So, I'm guessing it's got, in that case, magnetic fuse, like a modern missile or something. I don't think it's a magnetic fuse, I think it's just a time fuse. Mm, okay, fair enough. But yeah, we've never we've never really used them, but I'd love to see that. We can get into Normandy. 
fire. But they're kind of hard to aim because they also fire a little bit upwards yeah. because, you know, they're really big, so they have a lot of... Yeah, so you're going to just almost drop it onto a target. It's interesting. Um, and additionally, as well as that, I think um, it can have... Uh, this may not actually be quite true, but it can have... Um, Four fifty kilo, so four one hundred pound bombs roughly, and one one thousand pound bomb. Well, I didn't actually know that. I've, I've forgotten. Yeah, that. it's it's been a while since I've done that, but I think if you put on both rockets and bombs, you're going to run into issues. I don't think it's wired to do that. Ah, oh, that would be why I couldn't do it. I could I could add them on, but I couldn't fire the bombs in that case. Yeah, I think so. Interesting. Well, that, that explains that. Right, um, armament for the K4 Kerfa. So this is the latest, uh, September, October, no, yeah, so this is the latest one. And like Shah was saying before we turn the camera on, the rate of development of these fighters was probably, would you agree, the fastest in history? You know, probably. I mean, you know, you started World War II with a lot of nations still using late biplanes, um, and you ended World War II with early jets like the MiT-62 and the F-80, for example. Or P80, as they still call it. Roger. So rather than big advances in fighters coming every 10 or 20 years like we've got now, every couple of months, you know, a new generation of fighter would come out that would be superior to the rest. So yeah, it was a massive arms race on all sides. Not, on, not only aircraft, also tanks and all kinds mm. of stuff. I mean, if you look at early war tanks compared to a King Tiger in the end, for example, it's mm. just completely different. Uh, so we had two high metal Borsi uh, MGs. So it's got the two thirteen mil, near enough half inches in the cowling question mark. Yeah, kind of cowling above the engine on rear, and one. Uh, ah, this is interesting. A Mark R ah, thirty mil Mark one away. I actually forgot about yeah, that. I'll, I'll have to correct you there. That's that's a very common mistake. But MK one hundred eight or also the other thirty millimeter machine cannon the Germans have with a longer barrel, the MK one hundred three. That's not Mark. Uh, that actually stands for Machine Cannon Owners, so Machine Cannon. Machine Cannon. Interesting. Okay. Now, this, I mean, it's 30 mil, and it's going to be tiny if it's sitting in the V of the engine. So it's going to be another low-velocity cannon for bombers, I'm guessing? Yeah, I mean, you can look at pictures of the MK-108, actually. There's, there's plenty of pictures of those uh, out in the open. It's a really short barrel cannon for the caliber. It has a really low muscle velocity as well, but, you know, obviously 30 millimeter with a lot of mm -hmm. explosive filler. It's going to shrink everything in. Yeah, Roger. So I don't think it's something you'd really use against a fighter because imagine you'd have to leave it so much it'd be silly. Um, what you can do is you just get really up close and personal mm. uh, where you basically can't move. Mm, okay. Um, and I it... you, by the way, of the... Stand by. <laughs> well, yeah, tiny little stubby buggers, aren't they? That's mm, it's almost like, like a grenade can... launcher. Yeah, something like that. It's not, not too far off. Yeah, cool. Uh, 60 shots or something like that? 65 and a bit of fun around, if I recall correctly. So that's that, and it's mounted, well, in in the engine, above the engine, in front of the engine, kind of mixed in, roughly where the cursor is. But yeah, I mean, in general, the German aircraft were primarily designed as bomber intercept aircraft, particularly the BF-109, you know, a high climb rate, not particularly long range and heavy armament. Uh, it's kind of classic. Well, especially, especially 1994, yeah. Um, and uh, one time thousand pound bomb, uh, which is pretty cool. So that's that. Right, uh, I should apologise for kind of the graphics area, a bit crap. I've kind of knocked this together willy nilly like I usually do, but everything's here. Right, so let's next talk about power uh, and the engines. So we've got the, uh, what oh god, my brain, the Merlin 66 in the Mark 9 Spit. So it's the oldest engine by a couple of years. Uh, but combat power, so you get, I still don't fully understand this myself you get kind of a max rated power and then you get combat power um in in these engines and max rated power is if you like infinitely sustainable until you run out of fuel and combat power is a, a certain amount of power you can use for x many minutes i don't know how many minutes that is but it's going to depend i guess how you fly exactly so we're looking uh, at well i mean it, it's not only the minutes it's uh, also you know just for example the cool and dirty oil overheating mm -hmm. would be uh, one mm -hmm. limits that also, the thing is, if you use this too much um, over several sorties, you're actually just going to wreck the engine and you'll have to exchange it more uh, sooner. Oh, so in so, real life, you'd have to think about that then? Yeah, so the Russians, for example, as far as I know, didn't really have that. They were running their engines on, on max the entire time and just accepted that they'd have it, had to swap it out every, I don't know, five sorties. Yeah. 
Okay, so... While, while the Americans, for example, were trying to be a lot more efficient and were putting restrictions on how you could actually use it and, and were just you know, increasing the engine lifetime like that. I guess it depends on your infrastructure, really. If you've got bases set up with X many mechanics, then you can do that. If if you if you're you know you don't have a great infrastructure, you have to be more, more wary about keeping the engine protected, I suppose. Yeah. Also, in Russia, they just kind of assumed that you know after this many sorties, chances are the aircraft is shot down anyways. Yeah. So just use it while you can. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. The same. We haven't got any Russian uh, fighters in air, yeah, but I don't know anything about um, them. But... Getting an Ishak, but that's probably not going to be uh, you know much of you know much mm. in terms of competition against those. Yeah, these are premiums we're looking at here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the Ishak is like I think even before World War Two, the Germans fought those in Spain in the Civil. Wow. Okay. Sixteens. Sixteens. Yeah, I guess they were just left behind, the Russians in that case, which they were because of history, and we know all about that. Okay, let's carry on going through the engine. We've got the Merlin 66. From memory, it's 27 litre V12. Um, maximum combat power of just above 1,700 Imperial horsepower, which is pretty good. We're talking 1942 here, and assuming everything's accurate, then it's kind of impressive, really. Um, I think that went up to the Griffin, that went up to nearly 2,500 horsepower in the end, but we're talking 1944 end of 1944 for that so it's a super late war yeah um okay and the uh the p51d damn um you know what i've forgotten is it's not the allison anymore is it but this what don't think it was the merlin have you got it the encyclopedia up power plant packard v1650-7 liquid cooled supercharged v12 okay well uh, the spitfire was obviously v12 supercharged uh, twin stage supercharger, I think, and the P fifty one sounds like it's a similar engine. Then probably a V twelve supercharged as well. Anyway, uh, basically the same horsepower. I think the P fifty one actually has even a two stage supercharger. Roger, and it was uh, yep, this nineteen forty four. So the interesting thing is two years difference, but exactly the same horsepower, pretty much. So I'm not sure what that's all about. I and mean, it would make sense why the P-51 eventually got the Merlin, if, if the Merlin was just ahead of everything well, else. Well, the thing is, you know, the question is also which altitude are we talking about? Yes. That makes a lot of difference. That's exactly right. And as mentioned, uh, the Mustang was redesigned for high altitude, mm -hmm. long range, um, you know, bomb rescue. Roger, and you're all, well, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but my theory is you're always going to make better horsepower down low. At least it's the same with car engines, so... It may just be that the Spitfire is getting a better horsepower because it's optimized for down low. I think so, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dora. Now, this is actually interesting. Um, what I didn't realize, I'm, I'm a bit uh, ignorant of the Dora. I don't know anything about it, or, or should I say the Focke Wolf 190. The Focke Wolf 190, I thought, but all the big bubble nose versions with the, um, with the big with radial engine in. But it turns out it was only the earlier 190s with the radial. It's not just earlier versions, um, but yeah, the short nose version have a radial engine, and the long nose is a. In Roger. So this, so uh, it's weird. It's still got the kind of circular intake, if you like. Um, if that's the right word for that, but it's obviously a lot yeah, smaller I mean, diameter. Basically, just increase the length of the nose and the think of the tail as well to balance it out, and that's mm -hmm. it. It's up to the so the stub no, the radial would have been several feet shorter then, and it also had a fatter diameter, uh, yep. like the Corsair or something. But again, higher drag. Okay, um, so this is the this is the V12 type. It had, I think it was the Jumo, um, really big V12 engine uh, we had in here in this one here, and we've got. Um, I personally, I have no idea, but I would assume this is a high altitude fighter because it was probably designed to go and knock out. Um, uh, Lancasters and uh, B-17. It uh, also depends on the version, but I do believe that the doors were high altitude actually. Yeah, the, sh the step nosed one, not so much. Yeah, it feels like it. And a whopping great horsepower of uh, uh, 2,070 horsepower. Now, interestingly, we've got an expendable. So the combat power for the Dora and the Kerfurst are created by an expendable called MW-50. Do you want to go into that a bit? Uh, NW50 just stands for methanol water 50 50 mixture. Um, and that is injected into the supercharger before it goes, before the air goes into the engine. Mm. Um, so that does two things. First of all, it cools down the air, which means it can be compressed better and more efficiently. 
which means you're getting more oxygen in, and also I think uh, it just provides it with additional oxygen as well through the actual mixture. Roger. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so that's what we know about the, the Fokker Wolf engine. Onto the Curvest, and again, I'm a bit ignorant. Um, is it a V? It's going to be a Mercedes V12, I'm guessing. Uh, Mercedes. I'm not entirely sure who made the engine, but uh, yeah, it's an inline. Yeah. Um, so it's just simply the optimal engine for these fighters in terms of engine fitment, drag, and power. Well, it depends. I mean, the P47 did really well for itself, and that thing had a radial engine as well, double radial engine. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know anything about them really, but. Well, it had a really big, I think they called it double wasp, double 18 twin cylinder. Wasp, 2800 horsepower. A twin wasp. Yeah, I think it was insane. 2000 horsepower, yeah. But uh, they had better endurance as well, the wasps, didn't they? Or the, or the, um... Yeah, they were also built for long range. I mean, you know, a lot of people really loved the, the Mustang and, and say how great it wasn't. Mm. And it was a great fighter, but realistically speaking, it was probably more the P47 that broke the lift of his back. Mm. And the Mustang kind of came along and wiped up the rest afterwards. Yeah, it's a bit like the Spit and the Hurricane. Everyone loves the Spit. It's prettier, and but in terms of workload, it didn't do as much workload as the Hurricane in terms of an airframe. Um, but yeah. Um, okay. Uh, shit, I can't remember where I was going. Uh, power. Uh, Mercedes. So yeah, it's another big V12, 1762 horsepower. This is the K4 Curvest. So. Logic would dictate at this time in the war it was it was optimized for shooting down bombers, but I don't really know that obviously. But that's that's what I would have thought. Oh yeah, I mean that's why it's got this big whopping thirty millimeter cannon, and yeah. you know still a really good climb rate. I mean, not as good as the early one hundred nines, I think, comparatively to other aircraft, because mm. the one hundred nine just got heavier and heavier through its development. Mm. But obviously, they also put uh, better and better power plants in there. Mm. Okay, fine. Right, let's have a look at the wing loading. And we've got to bear in mind here, again, the Spitfire was a lot earlier. It had less stuff inside it. I think that would be a fair thing to say. Um, the wing loading is the amount of load on the wings. In this case, about kilos per square meter of the wing. And the wing loading for all aircraft, including today, is incredibly important. The lower the wing loading you have, more or less, is a more maneuverable aircraft, isn't it? Um, you know, yeah, but it also reason. means it also means that you have um, more drag yes. in comparison to your. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you get more wing, more drag at the end of the day. Yeah, so you're gonna you're gonna, actually you know more maneuverable is is a treacherous term because a lot of people just use it for low speed maneuverability, mm -hmm. uh, but at higher speeds, something like a BF109 is a lot more maneuverable than a Spitfire. Okay, well we can certainly say it gives more lift, or we can generate more lift easier. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay, let's keep it simple. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the picture even, you can see that the Spitfire's wing is signif significantly uh, longer, yeah. uh, than, than, and by longer I don't mean outwards, but lengthwise of the actual air. And it's also increased its size by the elliptical shape as well. You probably gained yeah. another 10, 20 percent there. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if if you gave me a World War II fighter in 1940s and said, do you want more wing loading or less link wing loading? I would pretty much always say, oh, can I have less wing loading, please? Because just for multiple uses, for multiple, all sorts of things, it just tends to be better. Um, but I would actually have to disagree with that. Uh, that's a good point for going for um, higher wing loading, actually, and that's simply you gain speed. Yeah. And you gain speed means you gain the initiative, it means you can engage and dis disengage as you want. While well, if you're a pure turn fighter, as the Spitfire mm -hmm. is basically, uh, that means you're always at the mercy of that, so, and all you can do is fight defensively until the other one makes a mistake and yeah. then strike. So you're reactive only, basically. Yeah. All right, fair point. Well, let's go through the wing loading. So we've got 100 here, uh, P51 nearly up to 160, which is a lot. And then almost unbelievably, the door up to 190. So the amount of kilos per uh, square meter of a wing is nearly twice as much as the spit. And then um, the curve verse is up to 170. Now that really surprises me because it feels to me like a high, low wing load fighter, but like the Spitfire. But I guess I'm wrong for whatever reason. And like Star was saying, this is a late version, so it's a lot heavier. Uh, and I'm guessing the wings the wings stayed more or less the same in this aircraft, didn't it, throughout the four Mostly, yeah. Years. I mean, I think the K4, they actually also made an effort to lighten the airframe mm -hmm. somewhat. 
Mm. It's still going to be heavier than something like an F version or an E version. Mm, right. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. So this Spitfire Mark IX would have been fighting E and F versions, wouldn't it? E and F version. Uh, just past the Battle of um, no, and a little bit later than that, isn't it? It's a G I think version. It's more, more like G versions yeah. would be the main uh, competitor. Yeah. And also early Focke Wolf, like Focke Wolf A. Focke Wolf A, yeah, cool. Right. Okay, that's that. Uh, next, we've got uh, length wings. Uh, sorry, length of aircraft and wingspan. Um, nothing particularly I want to point out. I'm surprised that the um, Mustang had such a high wingspan here. Really surprised by that. Yeah, that's also something you want for high altitude flight. Um, so I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the T152, for example. No. Uh, it's basically a further development of the Doras by the same uh, developer, Kut Tank. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why it's TA152. Mm -hmm. And they gave at least some versions really long wings because they were designed as pure altitude fire. Interesting. Makes sense. If you think about U2 or something, if you take it to the extreme. Yeah, I can quickly show you a picture if you want. Okay, you see, you get that. I'll just clean up here. Um, so, just things of interest to point out. The length of the 109 is very short. Very short. Um, and, and the wingspan is very small as well. That's that. Right, I'm going to come over and look at your picture. Right, what we're looking at here? It's, that's a long thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's a T one five two H version, I think. Um, wow. So that's in principle very similar to the Dora, um, just a further development of it with um, a focus on how to do combat. That's why it has such long wings. Interesting. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And uh, going the opposite way from that, the Spitfire had several clipped wing versions where two feet of either side of the wing was actually clipped off and squared off. And the main benefit, it made it a little bit faster, but it, it rolled. For, for whatever reason, the Spitfire had a terrible roll rate, something to do with the wing, obviously, and the ailerons, I suppose. But um, they clipped the, clipped the wing to um, mean it could roll better with these type of fighters. It gave it the same wingspan as this guy down here, who, who was its contemporary, of course. It's also, you know, the longer your wings are, uh, the, the more difficult it becomes to roll. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole thing when you sit in an office chair and you just spin yourself and then you stretch your arms out and, you know, take them back in and all. But, you, but what you're saying there is centrifugal, though. This surely would be more air resistant, or have I got that? Um, it's both. Uh, so it's conservation of momentum, basically, um, of rotational momentum, mm -hmm. and as well as air resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, right, maximum speed, very important, very important. Um, and these are all taken at uh, 25,000 feet. Now, I'm not sure if that means that they're all as fast... I'm not sure whether that is all of their maximum speeds happen to be at 25,000 feet or it's just that the measurement for this chart were taken at 25,000 feet. I'm, I'm not sure which one is which. It seems a bit unlikely that it will be the same speed, their maximum own speed at 25,000 feet. But. Probably just for the sake of comparison. I think so as well. But that said. Um, compared to what I feel, that is exactly how I feel it is in DCS. The spit is slow as nuts. Really slow. Low wing loading. Massively draggy wing. Can't go very fast. Add all that power on, but it can't overcome its own drag. Um, the 190 and the uh, blah, 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 spit, uh, Mustang are a lot faster. And then the 109 just goes even faster. Now, there's something I've never understood, because I've always considered the 109... A light low wing loading fighter like the Spit, and so I've never understood why it was the fastest aircraft, more or less, you know, throughout the war. Um, um, it's not actually, uh, I'm not entirely sure why it is according to this, but uh, Fokker Wolf should be faster than this, for example. Also, again, it depends on the altitude. If you put up a Mustang high enough, it should be higher than a BF 100 at the same altitude. Okay, okay. I'll leave, leave that one for now. Now, rate of climb is an interesting one. Um, the spit 4000 I mean these these numbers don't really mean anything to, to me but what you can do is compare them to each other 4100, 3200, 3300 4800 what I've never understood is why the um, Messerschmitt is so good at climbing, bearing in mind wing loading will really help climbing won't it and power to weight ratio and it doesn't actually wing, wing loading way. doesn't um, wing loading doesn't affect climb rate that much, it's primarily power to weight Okay, but let's go power to weight. We've got miles more power to weight 
uh, on the Spitfire, but it can't climb like the Messerschmitt. There must be something in that Messerschmitt that's configured for rate of climb, assuming it's accurate, and it probably is, you know, well researched and whatnot. Well, I mean, the entire aircraft is basically designed to be an intercept fighter, which means it needs a good climb rate, uh, yeah. but not particularly great range, for example. I mean, it's like the the older German version of a MiG-29, for example. MiG-29 is really good at climbing, doesn't have much range, but it's an intercept fighter, so it needs to do. Yeah, and I'd agree, this is in DCS when flying. This, If this thing starts climbing, you can't keep up with the 109 in anything, because it climbs so well, especially a Spitfire. But, and then the two bigger, what I'd call the bigger heavier fighters, this and this, which have much worse power to weight ratio, 190 and the 51, obviously are much worse at climbing, which, you know, follows basic physics. Uh, ceiling. Um, now, this must be because of low wing loadings. The only thing I can think is why the Spitfire has such a high ceiling and wing length. Yeah, probably. Like, wing loading is pretty important for service ceiling. Mm hmm. Um, the two Germans are basically the same, and the, uh, the Mustang's halfway in between. Okay, um, so ceiling, the weight, uh, we've chosen to use the empty weight here, which you might find, you might consider wrong, because if they were really fighting, they would be full of gas, wouldn't they? But, I don't know, for whatever reason we did it. Um, well, it's, it's difficult to compare otherwise. I mean, if you look at a Mustang, for example, if you fill that gas. thing full with gas, it has insane amounts and it's going to be super heavy. Exactly, and this is what we're going to come into. Why why these planes are diff better fighters than other... Why these planes are more useful than others is because, for instance, the Mustang can carry so much gas, but we'll go into that in a minute. Um, I mean, the thing is, though, for example, like the Mustang, uh, as far as I know, they actually burned some internal fuel before they started on the backs, just so... They weren't super heavy when they had to drop the bags and come. Oh, I didn't know that, but uh, it does make a lot of sense. You've got really good uh, capability to switch between tanks and that, yeah. Um, let's just go over uh, the airframe weights then. We've got, however you want to do this, 5,600 pounds of spit, really super light. Uh, we've got 7,600 airframe on the P-51, heavy. Seven, this is basically the same, 7,700 pounds for the Fokker, heavy. And 6,160 in the uh, Messerschmitt, uh, a bit heavier than the Spit. And I would personally always want a lighter fighter, because it makes sense to me in terms of physics. Have you got any pushback on that? Well, yeah, survivability uh, would be uh, heavier fighters in general. Because, again, they are faster. Chances are they can also soak up a little bit more damage if they get hit. Just the fact that they are faster and more, more noble at high speeds just means, as mentioned before, they just have the initiative. So they can attack, they can disengage, as long as they are not down low and slow, uh, which is a big mistake for something like a Fox Wolf 90, for example. Absolutely. They can always disengage and get away, something which, which a Spitfire just can't do. Yeah. Um, something uh, Talking about disengaging is very important. Um, most air fighter to fighter dogfights not in DCS. In DCS, we, we get into dogfights on purpose because it's a game and we like to have fun. In real life, you don't want to, you know, unless you're literally hunting fighters, you don't want to get in a dogfight, especially in a bomb, uh, if you're attacking bombers. So escaping an enemy fighter is incredibly important. And that's where we get to dive rate. Um, you can outclimb a, a fighter if you want, but it, it, often in the books I read, they dive. They dive through the clouds and the guy with the best dive rate can get away. Um, in my mind, the heavier fighter is assuming the same drag. The heavier fighter is generally going to dive better. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, for the most part, because uh, you know you're going to be denser. Uh, chances are you're going to have um, a low wing loading, which in this case is actually good. It means actually less good, drag. Yeah, less drag. Yeah. So uh, if, if I wanted to escape yeah. from a dogfight, I mean, assuming you've got altitude, I would want to be in a 190 and just plummet myself down to earth. I mean, another thing actually that comes into play there in World War II aircraft, particularly during the Battle of Britain, something that the BF-109s have used a lot, is the fact that the Spitfires had a carburet carburetor engine and the 109s had direct injection. So if a 109 had a Spitfire on its tail, all it needed to do was dip its nose, mm -hmm. and the Spitfire uh, would struggle with engine power for a couple of seconds when it dipped down, mm -hmm. because uh, the engine just wasn't supplied with fuel properly. Anymore. That's right. Well, the Spitfire had to, had to roll, had to invert, but it couldn't invert because his wings were so long that it couldn't roll in that time. So they had to get the clip wing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. So out of way, you're in trouble. Yep, absolutely. And, and so that's all of the facts and figures. And facts and figures are one thing. Um, actually flying the things is another thing. And flying the things in DCS. Now, what we found in DCS, uh, they've all got good points and bad points, just as they did in real life. And the good thing about the, in the DCS models is all of those good things and bad, bad points are the same that we see in the history books. 
Um, so, for instance, in the Battle of Britain, you had the Spitfire versus the Messerschmitt. Are they okay? They were different versions, but as it works out, it turns out roughly, you know, roughly within parameters, they're they're, they're similar to those versions that were fighting compared to each other. And in the books, it always says if a, if a Messerschmitt got on a Spitfire's tail, tail, the Spitfire would just turn and turn, do a constant rate turn as tight as it could. Uh, not necessarily tightness, but turn rate. Uh, presumably because of its wing load, it could just turn really well. And the, and obviously the measurement had to break off at that point. It couldn't keep with it. But on the other side of that, the Messerschmitt, compared to the uh, contemporary Spitfire, could dive. And if it dived down, A, for the reason that we just talked about, the engine problem, but also just in its airframe ability, the Spitfire would just slowly back off because it just couldn't keep up in a dive. Uh, yeah, also, you can't forget um, if you're in a heavy aircraft, uh, that actually means at the same at the same speed you have more kinetic energy, mm -hmm. uh, which means you have an easier time uh, overcoming the parasitic drag that's mm -hmm. holding you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's that's a thing. Um, these two. F so when we do our dogfights in DCF, uh, when we do our warbirds missions, we do our dogfights low down, which is it's not really unrealistic because you did have dogfights low down. But the majority of fighting, of uh, fighter on fighter, would have been in relation to bombers in World War Two, wouldn't it? It would have been fighters protecting bombers and fighters attacking bombers, and so in reality, it would have been twenty to thirty thousand feet at least the initial engagements. Mm. And that's where the and that's the ground for the P fifty one and the Fokker Wolf one hundred and ninety. And because we very rarely do these high level engagements, because in DCS they just don't work out as well in terms of mission planning, finding the target, stuff like that. It's much easier to set them up for low level. And in DCS, the one nine, the Fokker Wolf one hundred and ninety and the P fifty one, I find them pretty useless in a dogfight, assuming a low altitude dogfight. I'm presuming you would agree with. Um, sorry, so, oh yeah, so, but dogfighting. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the door you wouldn't necessarily want to go into tight turn turn fights with. I mean, it it bleeds energy really quickly since it's just so heavy and it doesn't have particularly good wing loading. Um, however, it does turn a lot better than a Spitfire at high speeds, at least for a short time until you bleed off too much energy and, and get too slow. And really what you want to do in something like a, a fuck wolf on 90 is do boom and zoom. So you come in for slashing attacks, uh, you go in, you get out. And I'd agree with the same with the Mustang. I mean, that's what you want to do. Like I said, no one really wants to get into a turn fight uh, because it's, it's anyone's game at that point. Um, yeah. Um, one thing, though, about uh, how to do dogfights, um, that is... That point stands true for the Western Front, I would say, primarily, but in the Eastern Front, not necessarily. We did have a lot of uh, low-flying ground attack aircraft, like the IL-2, for example, would be a well-known example. Um, and the Russian planes, almost all of them were pretty much designed for low-altitude combat, um, So, which is also quite funny, for example, the L-39, what is it called, the Aracobra? Okay. Um, was... Uh, Designed for low altitude combat and had a really high, um, a really large cannon, a 37 millimeter cannon, which the Americans really didn't like, and I think they even tried to give them to the Brits, and the Brits also were like, "Yeah, thanks, but no thanks." Mm. And then they gave them to the Russians, and the Russians absolutely loved that thing because mm. you know this was exactly their mo: it was a low altitude fighter, really good uh, down on the deck, and uh, large caliber guns, which they also liked. Interesting. Okay, didn't know about that. Okay, so yeah, so the profile is that these this guy up here, Spit and the Fox and the BF109 are just in DCS really good down low, really good turn fighters, uh, as good as each other. But the, the best dogfighter we say, especially especially for low down, but to be honest, even in in some cases up high, is the 109. It just wins every fight, and you can't re and I mean, it's not even easy to use. I find it very hard to use aircraft. It's it's just the best all rounder. It's yeah, very it's fast. It's got a really good climb rate, uh, which also means you can you can do sustained turn fighting with it. It doesn't turn as tight as a Spitfire, but it still turns pretty well. So it's just yeah. the most balanced aircraft. Yes, it's the most balanced. Aircraft. But but in some ways, so if so, if a 109 gets on the tail of a Spit, a Spit can lose it. We talked about because of ex extreme turn rate. But if this 109 gets on the tail of either of the other two, the Mustang or the 109 or the 190, 
uh, more or less any any altitude, you can't shake him. You can't get rid of him. There's no um, there's no move you got. You can't go up. You can't go down faster. You can't turn faster. You can't turn tighter. What do you do? There's not the really you can't go faster in a straight line. And we see that every time a 109 gets on anyone apart from a Spitfire and DCS, they die, assuming at equal pilot skill. Blah blah blah. I can't entirely agree with that. So generally speaking, although the numbers here in the sheet don't really support it, but I would say that the door is actually the fast aircraft. Mm. So at least in a straight line, it should be able to get away. And the BF-409, while it is better in the dive than a Spitfire Mark 9, it's not great in a dive. The Dora is great in a dive, and the Mustang is also pretty damn good in a dive. Um, so both of those aircraft should be able to dive away from BF-409, and if you Get them up to high altitude, the P51 should be able to up the floor with the 109. I think the problem we have in DCS is that people. Don't fight at high altitude, yeah, they're, because they're, they don't have a reason to. There's that, but it's, 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 as well as that, what, what you see, now, I think it's more about lack of experience, lack, in, lack of understanding. What you see every time is a 109, usually an experienced fighter, because like I said, it's generally. A more experienced plane to fly gets on the back of a average skill guy in a Mustang. Well, the first thing the Mustang guy does is start essing and you know um, uh, just starts maneuvering. He very rarely just puts his nose down and dives like you know like a real one would, um, and or, or doing a uh, you know a correct move or, or the 190. As soon as you see, see the 109 get on the 190 in DCS, you know human versus human, the 190. Just starts essing around and trying to dodge him, and, and all that does is lets the 109 reel in. Very rarely do you see them do a 15 degree dive and just max the shit out of the throttle. Yeah, to be fair though, uh, it is pretty hard to do well, particularly in a one versus one engagement in the fuck wolf on 90, mm. because literally all you can do is boom and zoom. You can't really turn fight, um, and that just makes it really difficult if you can't spot anything, which is quite hard to do in these. Mm. Yeah, spotting is obviously much harder than real life in DTS. But so I would actually say, as far as dogfighting is concerned, the Dora is probably the most difficult to fly aircraft in this game. Oh, it's hideous! Because as soon as you dogfight, the thing you want to do is get angle of attack. That's you know, you just you feel you feel you want to turn, you want to ramp that angle of attack up, and it can't handle it. Can't handle it. Yeah, well. it just spins out immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the way it spins out is nice. You very rarely actually crash it unless you're low, unlike the P fifty one, which is just a death trap. For whatever reason so it does recover nicely but that's it you're a dead man once you've spun out you're sitting there at 50 knots and someone's going to come and blight you um i hate i love driving it it's a it's the best plane to drive here it's just very nice to fly but in a dogfight all i ever want to do is just run away because i can't compete with anything yeah um right that's cool uh, i guess one thing we've missed out uh, so we're saying this. We're saying these things. We're slagging off the P fifty one. We're slagging off the one ninety in a bit. So why were they considered the best? Why was the one ninety? Why was the fifty one considered the best fighter plane? But one thing we haven't talked about is endurance, range, damage, uh, endurance as well. Um, the P fifty one was particularly heavily armed, as I armored, as I remember. Um, you know, if someone's shooting small. Wow. I mean, armor, as far as the aircraft is concerned, uh, is often overestimated. So the thing that most aircraft have is an armored windshield. And a lot of aircraft also have an armor plate in the back, although some pilots don't like to have that. And there's actually, I think, certainly in Germany, they had cases where people would just straight up remove armored plates because they'd actually uh, lower your visibility to the back. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. And, and, and also they're, you know, heavier as well. Now, I may have this wrong, but... Um... I thought in the P-51, maybe even this model, I remember looking at the cutaway diagrams and in this plane, and as far as I'm aware, in this plane only, it had armoured shields not just for the pilot, but just for, actually for a lot of the control things, like the, you know, I don't really, the pulleys and stuff that control the elevator and the rudder and stuff like that, it had these little armoured casings around, the little deflector shield, hence adding up to that massive weight that it's got. Um, I'm not sure, but the thing is, you got to be careful with these things because they're just going to add so much weight very yeah. quickly. Uh, so, I think the only aircraft I actually know of in World War II that you can really consider armored, Jug. and even that, no, actually, not even that, is the IL-2. Oh, okay. That thing had uh, quite a bit of armor plating. The Chug was overall very sturdy, but it wasn't necessarily armored. Interesting. Okay. 
Right, so anyway, I was going to talk about the range. Um, um, even even in our little DCS games, you know, we don't fly very far with warbirds because we don't do proper warbird navigation or anything. There's not much point. We go 50 miles. We go 50 miles to a bad zone. We do a little tangle with some enemies, and we come home 50 miles. And by that point, the Spitfire is on fumes if it makes it back at all. Uh, the, I can't remember the 109, but the uh, 19, uh, sorry, the P51 hasn't even used its first internal tank, and it's got several internal tanks. Same with the. Um, Focke Wolf 190, they can go so far. And in the reality of World War II, apart, unless you're literally just defending your turf like the Spitfires did in the Battle of Britain. Um, the one of mine did basically throughout the war almost mm. after the battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. And, and one of the reasons why the Brits won the Battle of Britain, well, probably the reason, is that the 109s had minutes of fuel once they got over london and wherever they had minutes of fuel to tangle and then they had to go home because otherwise yeah, a lot of fuel. Them had to ditch in the ocean on the way home as well yeah i mean yeah exactly they yeah but they just wasn't designed for that and so the introduction of the p51 that could suddenly go a thousand miles or whatever you know i don't know how far but a long way a game changer it's not the only reason why they were considered the best, though. I mean, the Focke Wolf 90 overall performed very well, and you can see it has just insane engine power. Mm. Um, the Allied actually did some tests with Dora's, you know, mock dogfights mm. uh, at the end of the war when they started capturing your bases and whatnot. Mm. And as far as I recall, the Dora would consistently wipe the floor with pretty much anything it went up against. Interesting. Uh, even the, the British Tempest, for example, which was considered to be a really good fighter then. Mm -hmm. the, the bits were very proud of, and they introduced a service ce uh, not a service ceiling, uh, just a hard ceiling mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't super high, which wasn't good for the door because it was uh, more geared towards mm -hmm. high altitude, and it wasn't even allowed to use MW50, and it mm -hmm. still mopped the floor with the Tempest. Um, the Mustang, it was a very good aircraft, but I think one thing that adds to the fact that, um, that it's seen as so good and possibly a bit better than it was um it's just the fact that it came late in the war and you know the germans were outnumbered and they were really low on pilots they really struggled with that in the end they just uh, sent people up with very little training that were barely able to keep their plane flying straight and the p51s would just come and mop those people up yeah obviously pilots get everything at the end of the day um yeah. lovely visibility in this in the uh, mustang They've designed that canopy so yeah that is that is very good as well um okay yeah, yeah. So that's that's one thing. I thought. in in reality, uh, I hear like you've just kind of said there, the one ninety was considered the most dangerous dogfighter. Uh, all things considered, I'm not. That's not true. That's not what I've heard. It was considered the best fighter. That's what I've heard in reality of World War Two, and I've never seen that. I've in DCS, I've never seen that. Even though they all appear to be modelled fairly well, and I guess I'll put that down to at the end of the day what we do the grim reapers not doing realistic fights uh, like i said we do kind of 10 versus five low level turn fights that's what we do because it looks cool and it's really good fun uh, but that's not what you know real world war ii dog fights were for the reasons we've said the yeah also i mean the germans basically never really had aircraft that were pure turn fighters no uh, not, not in world war ii at least you know they they started developing their energy fighting skills uh, over first over Spain and then in the, in the early days of World War II over Poland and, and France and such. And that's how they got a lot of experience with energy fighting, boom and zooming and such. And basically all of the aircraft designs of that time were geared towards that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Is there anything else you want to add to that, Stahl? Uh, not too much. Okay, well, thanks for listening. Obviously, needless to say, we are not aviation experts, and we may have said things wrong, but we do, you know, we do have a lot of experience in DCS with these things. So, I think what we said there is relatively realistic within our scope. Uh, please feel free to uh, comment, and in fact, I encourage you to comment, add details, make any corrections, and just talk because it's good fun. That's what we do it for. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you later.